Uh, we are going to be in for an amazing treat. Uh, Dr. Daryl Ray, aside from being a fun and wonderful person who knows how to throw a party, um, I guess a more professional intro would be Dr. Daryl Ray, author, speaker, educator, founder of Recovering from Religion and the Secular Therapy Project, um, yet another person who is using activism and resources for people who are without religion to make this a better world for us all. So uh, today, Dr. Ray is going to be talking about male shame and um, I guess I'm sure there'll be some resources about how we can help to combat these horrible ideals that oppress all of us, really. So, Daryl Ray, come on up here. Thank you so much. I get to get a Daryl Ray hug. These things are legendary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank Jamila. You. All right, good. If you've got a piece of paper in your hand, at least look it over if you've got time or haven't already as we get started here. Um, first of all, we're going to be talking about male shame, but if you haven't heard, I've, I, go, I have a podcast and I talk a lot about sex in there, even like duck sex. You know, I've talked about duck sex, polyamory, swinging, affairs, but always from a secular point of view. So if you get online and look for Secular Sexuality Podcast you will find some really interesting interviews. I've actually done several here while I've been here at the conference of, of people talking about what happens when you leave religion to your sexuality. And almost everybody says, much better. Uh, and some people even say, we're having orgies every Saturday night at our house. But, all right, but we're not going to talk about sex today. I promised Dave Silverman I wouldn't talk about sex today. I don't know what his problem is, but anyway. We're going to talk about male shame. As an article I published in, in uh, the December uh, edition of the American Atheist magazine. So to get into this, uh, first of all, I'm here to help us start a dialogue about a, an, an idea I don't hear anybody talking about. I want to offer some ideas that might lead you to some self-examination. By me, you, I'm not just talking to men, I'm talking to women too. But you will find that probably 70% of this talk applies mostly to men. And women, you can listen and kind of understand something, I think, from this as well. I want to try to explain some behavior about men that's otherwise puzzling, and I want to extend some compassionate understanding to the way men have been programmed in this culture. We hear a lot about how this culture programs women, but I think men can, are, are a big part of that as well. So uh, you've got a handout in your hands. You probably haven't had time to to um, write anything in it, but just kind of glance through it if you haven't already. Here's some questions I think are kind of interesting. Why are men so concerned with women's sexual status? Now, I know maybe you aren't, but lots of people are on this planet concerned about whether a woman is a virgin or not, has had sex outside of marriage, any of those kinds of things. What drives and motivates violence towards women not just in this culture, but probably in most cultures. What is the psychology of male dominance hierarchies, and how, do they, how are they related to women? And what drives men to shame women? What's that all about? So let's begin by understanding what shame is. I love Brene Brown's definition of it. She says, shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I will not be worthy of connection. That is really the essence of shame. I think it's a great definition. But I'm going to go into some other nuances of it. I think we need to, to think about shame as, as opposed to guilt. Guilt and shame are two different concepts that overlap if you think of them as a, as a spectrum. Guilt is usually individually based. Uh, I stole a piece of candy out of the store. I feel guilty about it. Nobody knows about it, but I feel guilty. God's convicting me and saying I'm guilty about that. But if, I, if I got caught, I would feel a little ashamed, but I'd mostly feel guilty. Shame comes when your identity is attacked, when your very identity, the very core of who you are. And that's, that tells us that shame is community-based, whereas guilt is more individually-based. The, the community shames a man or a woman for not being a virgin 
uh, or a man or woman for having sex outside of marriage. Those are, that's the way the community interacts. And in some cultures, it's stronger. In others, it's less. If you read my book, Sex and God, you know, I, I go into a lot of detail about what are shame-based religions versus what are guilt-based religions. So shame ch- chains people. It chains people and creates uh, this fear of being shamed really shapes uh, a lot of behavior. May, uh, shame makes, uh, it, if, I'm, if I feel ashamed or, or I'm afraid of shame, I then turn around and shame other people. So it perpetuates itself through those who are already afraid of the shame. And it motivates people to patrol the shame boundaries. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, you can go into the church uh, kitchen where it was all women in there cooking, and you could just hear all the latest gossip about who's had sex with whom, who got pregnant and shouldn't have been, and there's just tons and tons of shaming going on in that little clatch in the kitchen. And then when those women leave, they treat the person, the object of their shame, really badly. But the person that was the object doesn't even know why, because they don't talk about it out loud. It's a behind-the-scenes community thing. Female shame is largely centered around sex and sexuality, and it's enforced by other women as much as men in most cultures. It's taught from birth, and it oftentimes uses the ideas of disease and filth. Somebody, you are filthy for having, I just heard this the other day, somebody was telling me a story about their childhood training sexually, and they said, my parents said I was filthy because I had kissed a boy not had sex, just kiss a boy. This notion of disease is a very common one in lots of cultures. If you have violated a shame boundary, then you are a disease to the community. And many communities just push you out. That's what the Amish do. It's what uh, Mormons do. It's what the Muslims do. Lots of communities just shove people out because they don't want to keep the disease in their community. I think the disease model is very important for us to understand why people behave like they do but especially men, as we'll get to it in a minute. Male shame is rooted in the gender binary. It's very strongly rooted in the gender binary that a man must be a man, a woman must be a woman, and never the twain shall meet. Men are superior to women. Women are inferior to men. uh, And the male must be in control and be seen as in control. This is a really important concept. Without being in control, the male is the object then of shame by other males, and even females. Women will say, he can't control his his woman, for example. I've heard men say that many times. So a man also may be contaminated by women. And there's religious traditions, of course, that say certain times in the month, you can't even touch a woman or you'll have to go get cleansed. For two weeks out of a month, Orthodox women are dirty, filthy, diseased, as far as the Bible's concerned and as far as Orthodox orthodoxy is. So let's understand where this all comes from. Well, male shame is rooted in the need for acceptance by other males. It's pretty common. You go into a locker room and you see boys jockeying around and playing. And what, what it, it says is the boys need, deeply need approval from other boys, especially the dominant male boys or the alpha men or boys in the locker room. And it's based on probably, probably based on our hunter-gatherer history, and it probably has some function. It probably was very functional back in the old days of hunter-gatherers. Men shouldn't be seen as the weakest link. What do you think of a guy in this group? The weakest link, the, the kid who can't shoot an arrow straight. Do you think anybody wants to take him on a hunting trip? Hell no. We could all get killed because somebody didn't know how to shoot an arrow straight, or you know, he tips it with the poison and then shoots one of his buddies with the poison arrow. That would be a bad thing. So we can see within our hunter-gatherer's history, there's probably a lot of pressure on men and on boys to keep one another in line. So can a man be trusted to defend the tribe? Does the man have the strength to defend the tribe? Weaknesses in the group is a threat to the entire group. If I'm the weak guy in the hunting group, I'm, I'm a threat to everybody. But then what we see in our modern culture, this, we aren't a hunter-gatherer society anymore. What we see, though, is in the Boy Scouts and the military and sports football teams and men's groups, you see men constantly being shamed for behaving differently than the, than the uh, gender binary says. 
a man who appears to be weak on a football team, a, a man who cries, a man who shows compassion, is probably going to find himself on the shame end of a football uh, practice. <coughs> so, the long and short of it is a man must be seen as in control at all times. That may explain, that may explain why men don't ask for directions. Uh, I'm not trying to bring any too much down on us, but it probably does. You know, I, I wouldn't want to be seen as not knowing what I'm doing. It may, it may explain why men reject ideas from women in the presence of other men. I have seen, I, for 35 years, I was a corporate psychologist, and I worked with Exxon and Shell and Blue Cross Blue Shield, you name it, I probably worked with them. And what I saw in those in executive level meetings was frequently, all too frequently, women had great ideas and the men just ignored them. It was very difficult as well for a woman to correct another man in the group. The dynamics are very strong in the good old boy network. So I saw many ideas rejected based upon the gender of the person, not the quality of the idea. We also see that if a man's not seen in control, he may respond violently with anger to women who seem to be insubordinate, not properly deferential to women. Uh, and we may have see that men, and I see this a lot too, men have a hard time accepting feedback directly from a woman. The, the, his best buddy may say something that's identical, but to take it from his girlfriend, his wife, his coworker who's female, much more difficult for a male to do because we've been programmed, you should be in control, men are superior to women. How can you take direction from a woman? And I've actually had to work with men in the workplace that said, I, I can't work with that woman. I can't, I'll quit before I work with, for a woman boss. I mean, that's pretty stupid, but it's based on this notion. And I've really seen it in the religious groups, people who are very, very religious in the workplace. So what it tells us is there is a terror of the feminine. Feminine is definitely seen as less, as subordinate, as something almost diseased or something that's not as good as. And... So men don't want to get attention to draw, drawn to themselves, so they have to walk, act extra macho. And the, the macho veneer really betrays what may or may not really be going on inside the guy. Boys are taught to be terrified of the feminine, and they may call each other girls. Well, you're, you throw like a girl. Anybody heard that one before? Uh, or being called a homo, or being called a sissy. Yes, homosexuality is equated with femininity as something inferior in, in male culture. In the military, in the, in the football team, what does a coach or what does a drill sergeant call somebody? Yeah, pussy, you're, you're, a, you're, you know, you're a girl, you throw like a girl. I mean, we've got all these, or you're, what are you, gay? You, you shouldn't be, you know, all these terms come out of the, of the alpha male or uh, strong male dominant uh, characteristics of people like drill sergeant or scout leaders, uh, football coaches. Oh, I see it terribly in football coaches. High school boys are subjected to this concept that women are inferior to men all the time by football coaches. And it's no wonder that you get lots of Christianity on football teams, because Christianity teaches the subjection of women, of course. So, showing weakness is about the worst thing you can do in a, in a patriarchal, male-dominated society. And I'm going to give you some ideas here. You've probably heard these. Men are shamed for not controlling their women. Here's a quote, and I've heard this myself. Can't, he can't keep track of his girlfriend. Okay, like he owns his girlfriend. Or men are shamed for failing to display dominance over a woman. His wife wears the pants in the family. How many of you have heard that one before? Yeah, that's bullshit. I mean, it's amazing how our culture is just propagating this, and oftentimes we don't even think about it. I know when I was a kid growing up in a church where these kinds of things were said routinely, it didn't bother me a bit. Yeah, that's the way Paul said it. Women should cover their heads and all that sort of stuff in the church and be submissive to men. Men are shamed for behavior that looks submissive with respect to, to women. For example, he has to ask his girlfriend before he can go out with us tonight. Right, like he... He's submissive. He's subjective to his girlfriend. Men are shamed for sexual activities that aren't seen as masculine, like masturbation. I've heard this before. He's not man enough to get laid. That's why he jacks off. You know what I think about masturbation. So, 
If you've heard any of my talks before, we won't be going there today. So, what is learned by all this? Male identity is closely tied to dominance and superiority over women. Men are encouraged to engage in threats of violence to control women. And I saw this in my church. You didn't have to hit a woman. All you had to do was to threaten sometimes. And in our church, there was abuse going on behind the scenes. I knew this. In Wichita, Kansas, when I was growing up, men learned to respond with violence or threats of violence to women who don't defer to them. And we see this in Orthodox Judaism and Islam, Hinduism, Baptist, Mormon, you name it. If it's a strong patriarchal uh, cultural or environment, then you are going to get violence against women. So let's talk about religious male shame and how that fits with control of women. Imagine for a moment that you have been taught since you were a little boy, and I'm speaking to men here, that the eternal salvation of your family, your children, your wife, your grandchildren is totally dependent upon you. That you personally could be responsible for sending one of your children to hell, for example. And by not praying with them and not having regular services in the home, you're, you're damning them to some eternal damnation. So your most important task is to ensure that your children and grandchildren get into the afterlife. That is your task on this earth. And the most important task a man has, and a woman cannot perform that task. She can only do it second best at most. So what it does is it, it links your identity to shame because your identity is largely consumed with what religion you belong to, what your God tells you, and if you don't do it, you're going to be shamed. Shamed by your family, shamed by other people in your community. So I'm res- here's the deal. I'm responsible for the conduct of my entire family. That's, that's the source of shame. My wife and daughter's dress and their behavior, their conduct directly reflects upon me, directly reflects upon my, our family. So if I'm not controlling my women, I'm in danger of them not only going to hell, but influencing other people. And it also reflects on me as a dominant male, fulfilling Paul's commandment that the man should be the head of the household. So my failure to control and discipline will bring shame down upon the entire family. So men are doing a lot of behavior out of the potential loss to their dignity and identity from out of male shame. So this results in the man, especially in a very religious cultures or from fundamentalist religions, being more prone to violence. There's a lot of evidence. The, most, the number one predictor of violence against children and child abuse is drug or alcohol, alcohol in the family. The number two predictor is religiosity. Number two predictor of, of violence against children and child abuse is religiosity in the family. So a man's dignity is tied to his superiority over women. What a fucking crazy place to get your dignity. Why in tarnation do you have to oppress somebody else to get your dignity? That's pretty, that's pretty crazy. And it's going to undermine a lot of psychological and emotional health in men. Men are subject to, men, women are subjected to threats and, uh, and violence even when they're not sufficiently deferential to men, as I mentioned before. And men shame women for behavior which is seen as reflecting on the man. You're not going to go out in that dress, are you? And that's, you know, slut shaming comes right. When I slut shame, it's probably because I'm afraid of shame myself. That's the, that's the interesting thing about what we're talking about here. We need to understand what's going on in the man's head, what the man's being programmed to, uh, from, so we can understand why he would treat women or his daughters or other uh, people of, in any gender the way they do. So, and then, of course, men turn around and blame the women for the violence that was caused against them. If you hadn't dressed like that, you wouldn't have gotten raped. If you hadn't dressed like that, you would have probably gotten the job. You know, there's, there's a wide range of things you can use. So male and female shame are two sides of the same coin in my book. And let's begin with some concepts. I think virginity is one of the key concepts for sub- subjecting women. Virginity is a religious idea. It's not a biological concept. There's nothing in biology that says anything about being a virgin. You don't get better babies if you're a virgin before you have your first sex or anything like that. So it's a religious idea and goes way back, and it's primarily designed to control women in a patriarchal society. It's a great shaming tool. You weren't a virgin when you got married. 
some cultures you can be thrown out, you can be stoned, you can be divorced. And in this culture, in the purity culture, which we see here, really creepy. I mean, these guys are, I, there's a whole website of purity culture pictures of fathers doing everything but fondling their daughters, it looks to me like, kissing their daughters. I mean, it's really, really spooky and looks like, looks like what it probably is, you know, molesting your daughters. Girls' sexuality belongs to the father in the purity culture. That's just the way it works. And the father has a proper duty to protect his property until he sells it or gives it away to the husband. Yeah, that sounds like something they do over in Saudi Arabia. Uh Uh-uh, it's happening right here. That picture that you see up there was taken in Colorado Springs at a purity ball where a father gives his daughter a (laughs) ring. It looks a hell of a lot like, uh, uh, you know, getting married. If the daughter disobeys this, then shame is brought down upon her, and especially by the males in the family because the males are supposed to keep her pure. And that includes brothers and, uh, aunts, uh, brothers and uncles. Of course, other women too. A lot of domestic abuse comes from this concept that you must be pure sexually. Well, why must women be pure sexually? I don't hear anybody talking about men being pure sexually. That's the way the patriarchy works. If a woman's not pure, it reflects upon the man who is having sex with that person, with that woman. I've heard it so many times... My wife had an affair, get this, a man says, my wife had an affair, and I feel ashamed. Why would a man feel ashamed of his wife having an affair? Unless there's something else going on there. I won't go any farther, I could do a whole lecture on that one alone. So, let's begin with the most important concept, and that's life after death. After life terror. Most of the patriarchal religions teach terror of the afterlife. And so what that leads to is abuse of children in the name of Jesus, in the name of the God, in the name of Muhammad or Shiva or whoever. This fear of hell is an insidious concept because it gives people permission to do whatever they damn well please to their children, to their daughters, to their wives, to any, actually anybody in the community if they don't live to the standards that they, the artificial standards that they are setting. Communities talk about disgust over a woman who's strayed, over the harlot. It's full, it's, it's just all over in the Bible. So this license to abuse really is a key to why we see so much abuse in religious, in religious groups. And, and it doesn't have to be super cult groups. I mean, most people don't, oh, people are always telling me how nice the Mormons are. Well, I, you get inside of the Mormons and look at what's really going on. It's a pretty strongly sex-negative culture where women have to deal with tons of shame. And I know this firsthand because I just finished, I've dealt with a lot of Mormons in my life, but we've also been interviewing for my podcast, Mormons, ex-Mormons. And the amount of shame that culture teaches women is just ridiculous. The amount of shame taught to men in the Catholic culture is ridiculous. And I could even give a whole talk on the Madonna whore syndrome and how it disrupts and actually terribly uh, hurts male sexuality uh, of those who are in Catholicism and even those who have left. Is this, con- is this rare that have child abuse and religious inspired child abuse in your neighborhood? I don't think so. You get a Jehovah's Witness family in your neighborhood, a Mormon, a Seventh-day Adventist, a Muslim, any patriarchal culture or religion is, is going to have to use the afterlife terror to terrorize children, and it also gives that father excuses to whip or beat or spank or, or if nothing else, psychologically abuse the child. So I think the amount of child abuse in the United States is far greater than is ever reported because the religious aren't going to tell you, yeah, I beat my kid silly last week because he, uh, he said he didn't believe in God. But we see this. You heard Sarah Moorhead yesterday a 12-year-old who might get thrown out of her home because she didn't believe the shit that her parents are giving her. That's child abuse, and it's religiously inspired child abuse. So if you have any of these religions in your neighborhood, you've probably got some abuse going on. Shame-based religions. The male's responsible for the female behavior. Female submission to authority. Female sexuality is dangerous. Started right there in the Bible with Eve 
tempting Adam. You know, that was all about sex. Um, not sure what she was doing. Maybe she was giving him a blowjob. I don't know. But something happened between the two of them. And the Jews, the Jewish community took that on. If anybody tells you Jews are less sexually uptight than anybody else, maybe in some areas, but overall they're not. Every one of the patriarchal religions is oppressive to women, even fairly liberal uh, religions. And finally, male sexuality is really, really restricted. I mean, missionary style once a month is about all that's approved in a lot of religions. I mean, even going to doggy position or oral sex is seen as terrible in, in, in some religions. The Southern Baptists can't hardly talk about this stuff. Even though they don't necessarily disapprove of it, they can't even talk about it. So let's get on to what does, how does this apply to you? I mean, personally apply to you. Well, first of all, I heard a quote the other day that you can leave religion, but religion doesn't leave you. You have got things inside of you. Part of the reason I wrote my book, Sex and God, part of the reason I do the podcast is because I hear atheists coming up with the dumbest ideas about sexuality and about gender relationships. Just because you're an atheist doesn't mean you haven't gotten rid of some of the religious bullshit that you were taught as a child. And I call these shame hooks. Religion still has shame hooks in, in you. For example, do you feel un uncomfortable being corrected by a woman in public, by your wife or children in public? Do you feel like you have to have more education than your female partner? Do you have to have more salary than your female partner? Does that in some way make you feel uncomfortable or shamed? If you're a man, do you feel shame about masturbating? Men who, what's the old saying, 97% of men masturbate and the other 3% lie. Well, most of us masturbate. If you still feel shame about that, that's probably a shame hook that comes out of your religion. Uh, shame of asking for you want in, what you want in sex. Do you feel ashamed to say to your partner, I would like to do this in sex? And just as bad as, do you think you're, are you ashamed because your partner might reject that or call you a pervert? Well, maybe your partner is infected with some of the same shame ideas. Shame of enjoying porn. Yes, porn. Greta Christina writes really good porn. They may call it erotica, but just think, I've asked many feminists that were against porn. I said, do you like Greta Christina's work? And they said, yeah, I, I like that. that. But that's erotica. I said, well, what if you took and filmed it? Would it still be erotica? The exact same thing becomes porn only when it's put in visual format. And I see this kind of contrast. We aren't thinking these things through and asking, what is this? Yeah, I'm all against sex slavery. I'm all against uh, the oppression of women. I'm all against the use, uh, the coercion of women into things like porn if that's happening, but it's not necessarily happening. Shame of being seen as less than men if engaged in non-traditional activities. Uh, a man who said, I'd sure like to have anal sex with my wife, but I'm ashamed to ask for it because it looks like I'm behaving like a woman. Yeah, that's a shame hook. I could go on and on and on and on and on. In fact, you've got a whole sheet of paper in front of you that talks about a lot more of those shame hooks. One of the key things I've seen through this recession is men being ashamed of being unemployed. I've had men tell me, man, I know better, but I just feel terrible. One man told me, I wish my wife had lost her job because I'd feel much better about it if it was her than me, the breadwinner. How can the breadwinner lose the job? That was really devastating to him. It took him a long time to get used to that. I don't know that that person ever did. Uh, men who are unemployed oftentimes feel less than other men because of their unemployment status. Um, so, male shame and, and behavior. Male shame can drive men to express their sexuality in uh, violent or even inappropriate or even illegal ways. As I've studied over the years, I think a lot of violent behavior coming from men is directly related to their shame about their own bodies, about their beliefs of being superior to women. All that stuff kind of comes down to it, and the man doesn't know how to control his emotions because he's got this conflict. Uh, he keeps, a man keeps, for example, things inside himself. He doesn't tell his partner what he really wants. He feels ashamed. So what's going to happen to those feelings and beliefs and desires if he doesn't share them with his partner and communicate openly? probably going to come out somewhere else that's inappropriate. 
It makes man, a man hate himself for masturbating. I don't know how many atheists I've had tell me, I had one just out there come up to me and said, you help me get over my fear of masturbating or my shame of masturbating. Wow, that made my whole day. I'm glad somebody can now jack off without feeling bad about it. <laughs> So why the hell are we ashamed? Because we've still got shame hooks in us. And I'm not saying you're wrong if you still got them, but let's work on them. Let's get rid of those shame hooks. Uh, it, it leads men to violence against other men. If you call a man a pussy and he, and he can challenge you physically, he may turn around and beat, beat the crap out of you. That's a whole shame dynamic going on there. And it's, it's a lesson in Who's dominant and who's non-dominant? I mean, there's all sorts of crap that goes on in those kinds of interactions. Shame alienates us from ourselves. That's the bottom line in what I'm trying to tell you here today. Shame makes us project our anxiety onto others. If I'm ashamed that I'm not the proper head of the family, if I'm ashamed that other people may see me as not making, controlling my women then I will act that out. I will project that. I'll project it on the daughter, onto my, my uh, partner, or whatever. And it, it comes out inappropriately. It prevents us from exploring who we are and becoming all we are. You don't have to be a macho guy to be a full human being. You can be whatever the hell you want to be. You can wear women's clothes. I don't care. You can, you can engage in anal sex. There's lots of things that appear to be feminine. But if we are... Truly understanding what masculinity is in this culture, and I think we're still trying to define that uh, in this culture, we have to start thinking about what are the shame hooks that are put there, and are they useful or not? Most of them aren't. I think it's shame, male shame stunts our growth and inhibits our emotional intelligence, becoming better human beings and treating other people well. So let's break the chains of shame. What beliefs about women? Homosexuals, transsexuals, are you taught or were you taught? And do you still have some of those beliefs in your head? Do you see, when you see two men kissing out on the street in front of the Christians, do you get a little cringe about it? Is there something going on inside of you? I mean, I, I still get cringes about things. I think, where'd that come from? Well, it came from my very early training, and I'm still working on getting rid of it. I, I'm not here to say I'm perfect. I'm still working on shit, but I'm glad... I'm glad to be aware of it. I want to be aware of it. What ideas about masculinity and power were you taught about yourself and about women? Is it okay for man, women to be superior to men? Do you feel ashamed about your sex life? Do you experience difficulty expressing your desires to your significant other? Is there, is there something you can't tell your partner because you're ashamed of it? Now, I'm not saying they might not have problems with it, and I'm not saying they have to do what you ask. But if you're ashamed to even talk to the most intimate person in your life about the most deepest desires you have, something is fucking wrong. And you're probably not fucking as well as you could either. <laughs> is it difficult, and this is for you guys, is it difficult for you to accept your partner's desires and requests? I've had so many men say, my wife wants me to do X, Y, or Z, and I could never do it. A good friend of mine says, I could never go down on my wife because I was taught when I was a little kid. This guy's an atheist. He's been an atheist all his life, and he still can't go down because his Methodist mother said oral sex is filthy, and he still can't get that out of his head. So what is the most difficult thing for you to do in relation to your partner, for example? Ask for something? Ask for what you want? Is that difficult? Uh, acting like or doing something that's traditionally seen as feminine. Uh, if you've got any of those shame hooks in you, then that's a nice place to start asking some questions and doing some internal work on yourself as a male in this culture. So I want you to recognize, like, if you have a judgmental thought, you see a woman walking down the street and say, wow, she's dressed like a slut. If that goes through your head, yeah, it might go to your head because it was something you were taught very young. But you can dispute that thought and say, okay, that's that old training. How do I need to think about that? Uh, if they, if you, um, hold on, just lost <laughs> Listen to yourself, listen to your tell talk. You don't have to do anything about it, but you do need to do some internal work about it. So, 
My fear is, and I, I want to be the real clear in this last couple slides. My fear is, I'm not given new information so you can go out and criticize men. So this is not a way to say, well, that explains why he doesn't put the seat down. No, don't. I, I'm not interested. I want you to just do some internal work. It's not a way for you to talk about the behavior you don't like. Why don't you ever ask for directions? Well, that may or may not be related to male shame. But let's not, I don't want to use it as a tool to bludgeon men. That's not, I'm a tool to self-reflect. And you know, there's as much self-reflection for women in this as there is for men. Uh, but I've been talking mostly to men today. I don't want men to come out and leave this meeting feeling I dumped on you. I didn't dump on you. I'm just giving you some questions to ask. And I want you to feel dumped on. I want you to feel challenged. And I don't want men to, think, men to think that they operate, or women think that men operate from male shame all the time. Here's the benefits that come to us guys if we look into this. Freedom from unrealistic expectations in a culture that we cannot possibly live up to, and in fact we shouldn't live up to. The ability to identify and change our beliefs. Beliefs that undermine our own confidence in the bedroom. Many, as I work with people in, as a sex therapist over my career, as I work with them, I find many men have beliefs in their head that have something that impact their cock. They, they, can't, they can't separate these two, right? If I can change the beliefs here, the penis can perform. Uh, a guy came up and said, I think I've got ED. 35-year-old guy, I think I've got ED. I think I need some Viagra. I said, well, can you masturbate? Does it get hard when you masturbate? Oh, yeah, I can do that. Well, then you don't have ED, guy. You have relationship problems. And you need to look at relationship problems there. Last, what's the benefit? It gives us some tools to relate to our partners more honestly and openly. It helps us understand our feelings and our behavior and take responsibility for our masculinity in this culture. So let me wind up with one quote. I love this quote by Jacqueline Purcell. You must unlearn what you've been programmed to believe since birth. That software no longer serves you if you want to live in a world where all things are possible. So take a listen to my podcast, the Secular Sexuality Podcast. And uh, if you'd like, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be uh, signing books out there. But if you buy either book, I'm going to give away... a a second book, My Performance Culture, because I want to encourage leadership, and I'm trying to push people to think about what it means to be a leader in the secular community. So if you buy any books, you're going to get another one for free today, and I'll sign it, and I'll talk to you about it. Thank you.